Chalcedon. Um, uh, they've influenced uh, um, many theologians in the tradition uh, who have said, well, because they're, they're committed to taking uh, the Christian scripture as grounds for, for the truth of theology, okay? So they're not just making this up. They take it, they're, they're, they're constrained by the correct interpretation of these holy scriptures and so on. In those scriptures that are counted as authoritative and holy, um, uh, there are things that say things like God's hand does this and that. Well, if God has a hand, then surely God the Father has uh, you know, a body as well. No, don't take that literally. The process and, and the art of figuring out what's to be taken literally and what isn't is a difficult thing. I don't know whether anyone has clearly specified it, but what is not taken metaphorically are these claims that Christ is passable and impassable. So there are a group of claims that are, as you say, taken metaphorically. Um, there are a group that are taken literally. It's that core group of <coughs> literal, to be taken literally claims that fuels this. Now you might say if they would drop that and just take it all as metaphor, um, they avoid the problem. Absolutely correct. Um, But I think that the main motivation for doing that really would be to avoid the, the, the apparent contradiction. Um, and as I've tried to emphasize, the tradition keeps coming back to the importance of this apparent contradiction. Um, there's no doubt, if I, if I were a, a, a church historian about this stuff could tell you a good answer to your question, why these aren't treated as metaphor. Um, I'm not one, so I can't, I can't explain. But I do know that that's just ruled out as not an option with respect to these claims. These are supposed to be the fundamental truths about Christ, not the fundamental metaphors. Something like this. So I, I, I'm sure, I hope I haven't convinced you uh, by saying that, but, but, uh, but that's sort of the, the direction of the answer. Thank you. Okay, so um, just bear with me just for a minute. No worries. So uh, I want to talk about the, the bit on, on the logic. Yes. And the, the argument basically here is that uh, logic has to be topic neutral. Yes. And you have this domain of objects in theology which uh, really don't play well with classical logic, right? So, yes. but then that's a standard move in, in the literature for people who are sympathetic to classical logic uh, as their logic is to just uh, look at cases in specific domains, for example, impossible objects or vagueness, whatever, and explain how there's some strategy for saving uh, the, the classical account, right? Yes. So it, in, this, in this instance, you mentioned an objection, but you didn't really go deep into the objection, and I would like to. So and, and just very, very, very quickly. Yep. So you said, OK, theologians could say something like, uh, Christ, qua divine nature, has property P, and Christ, as uh, qua human, uh, qua person, qua human person, has property not P. Right. right? But then uh, think of something like um, the metaphysics of, of persistence, right? So some people will say something like an object that sometimes, uh, an object has some pre, some, some property P uh, in some way, for example, a verbalism or something like that, and has some property not P in some other P way, right? And you said, and in, in, in those, those, those types of metaphysical positions seem to be uh, an open uh, an open way to uh, to to respond. And and you might say, okay, but uh, and, and you said something like this. You said, but these people know their literature. They know what the, they are. The theologians. They know how, how, how what's the problem here is. And, but they should revise their logic. But then someone might say, why not revise your metaphysics? I mean, if they can be mistaken about logic, they could be mistaken about metaphysics. Okay, okay, good, excellent. Um, 
Uh, a couple things. Uh, let me just point out that the claim that I'm proposing a revision of logic is actually a, a bit contentious. Um, I, I'm not proposing a revision of logic. I'm proposing a re revision of your account of what you think logic is. Um, so, th but I think that matters. But so it's not like I'm I'm saying, hey, we should change logic. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, you couldn't. Um, uh, so that's the first thing. Second thing, why not go uh, uh, revise your account of metaphysics versus revise your account of logic? This is an option, no question. And if you look at the literature on the fundamental problem, you'll see a lot of, um, uh, some people are uh, upfront about being very scholastic and, and making metaphysics it's very complicated. Um, uh, that's an option. Um, and I'm not going to take time now to argue against it. I take it as a burden that I must do so. And in, in, this will be part of a book project. Um, but you mentioned the temporal uh, analog, which uh, there's um, an analytic theologian, theologian called um, uh, Timothy Powell, uh, who has a proposal that runs with that uh, and tries to think of it as um, on analogy with temporal intrinsics and that kind of thing. Um, that's interesting. Uh, um, uh, I think it has problems. I'm not going to go into them all here. Um, let me go to your very first question. Which, so you really weighed the three different things. Uh, and, and the first question, though, was a general one, which I think might be uh, valuable. Um, um, ah, yes. Can't we just say the classical logic, the, 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 the standard account of logic is correct, but then just say that these are really pointing to impossibilities or something? That is what one will say if they think classical logic is correct, of course. But if you are adopting this worldview where these are true, you can't, you can't say that. So you can't appeal to that kind of stuff. Um, so I don't see any way of saving uh, classical logic by just appealing to sort of possibilities that go beyond the domain of things over which logic proper is defined or something. Um, but yeah, spot on. And uh, have I answered enough? I haven't given you details on anything. I think, but I think it's enough. enough. OK, yeah. thank you. OK, thank you very much. My question is actually very similar to the previous one, yes. or to the one of the three sub-questions, especially for the end. So you've been talking about uh, uh, you know, divine nature and human nature, so uh, constantly, especially Toward the end of your talk, you talk about one person, two natures, uh, as if uh, divinity is a nature which is possessed by this guy, which is called Christ, uh, and humanity is also a nature which uh, might or might not be possessed by this guy, which is called Christ. But what if the real nature is uh, only one, and then there are different states, and depending on the states, uh, in which this guy Christ uh, decides to manifest his divinity, can actually acquire different properties. And I want to elucidate this problem through a very mundane example. Mm -hmm. So we can say that H2O in its liquid state uh, or manifestation is the thirst tension, boils uh, at 100 uh, degrees and so on and so forth. But then H2O in its gas state uh, is not thirst tension. So we might be tempted to say that H2O is both thirst tension and not thirst tension, but the nature here is the molecular structure of H2O, but depending on the states in which it manifests, it can actually acquire different properties. In the case of Christ, because he's divine and he's not only the Son, he's also the Father and the Holy Ghost and many other things uh, he wishes to be, he can also decide to manifest itself uh, in a human form 
And therefore, in that particular state, uh, he has the properties of being able to suffer. <coughs> yeah. What can we do about that? Well, I think that that's certainly, um, uh, as you said, like the previous question, that points at a sort of detailed way of maintaining the standard account of logic as classical, getting around the contradiction, and yet maintaining a sense in which both of these are still true. Um, the problem is that what you've just done is um, spelled out uh, what amounts to um, a sort of version of canonic uh, Christology by denying that there are really two distinct natures, thinking of them instead as uh, different states that are never had at the same point in time, uh, which is, I mean, your, your, your concrete example is nice because it illustrates one way of being a canonic Christologist by denying that there's a point at which the object is in both those states. Um, yeah, that's a vision divinity of divinity is not a state. So divinity is the nature. Of and there's no and so so he decide to be in a particular state, which is the human state. Then he might decide to be in an angelic state. So he can decide to go on another dimensions and so so and so forth. But like the divine nature here plays the role of the H two O. That's like the the things which underlies uh, all the different possible manifestations of Christ, uh, whereas humanity here plays uh, the role of, uh, you know, being uh, water or in a little state. So then this uh, divine uh, nature slash H2O can be in a gas state slash angel state. Uh, well. Yeah, yeah. So, um, again, uh, So are you rejecting that there are two different natures? I, I'm not rejecting it, you're, but you're, I, don't say, I don't see why we should presuppose that both divinity and humanity are natures. Okay, let's... Well, because that's okay. an assumption that... Built into the theory, yes. But I mean, that, that's the sort of theory that's emerged over all these years by... by the, I'm, not, I'm not saying therefore it's true. I'm just I'm saying that's what we're working with. But let's be loose, a little bit looser with how we understand nature. Let's say they're not natures, they're states. There's a divine state and there's a human state. Um, so let's be... Um, no, again, okay. there's a divine nature and many other different states. Okay. Sorry. Uh, can we move on? Oh, sure, 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 sure. Yeah. Okay, let's yeah. talk about yeah. the questions. Let's talk about that. I think you're just rejecting that the, the key entity has these two things, in which case it just sounds like you're going down this road. But and why would you that? <laughs> okay, okay, okay. okay. So we can talk more after. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. So, um, no? I have to yeah. yeah, we have a bunch. I'm Thomas. Yeah. You don't know where in the queue I am. No, there are like a lot of questions, so uh, please brief questions. And brief answers. <laughs> okay, <laughs> yes. Okay, uh, so, uh, you know, Nozick had this thing where he wants to said like the goal of philosophy is to answer the questions like how could this possibly be the case? And um, yeah, I'm kind of feeling like that question has not really been answered. Uh, so I'm finding this a little unsatisfying, I guess, because I mean, one way to answer the question of like, how could it possibly be that you know Christ can't suffer and also he can suffer is to you know show that one of them is false or that it's some kind of ambiguity or something like that, equivocation. But you're not doing that. Right. You're just accepting that he can and can't suffer. But don't you still face this demand to explain how this could be the case? And not even how it could be the case given standard logic, but just how it can be the case, period. It just seems weird. <laughs> I don't see how it can be true. Um, good. Well, I, I think that that's an important question. And I do think that the, the Nozick project, as you rehearsed it, as far as you rehearsed it, is what I'm up to. But of course, there's a bit of an ambiguity just in the, the project, right? 
when you say, how can it be the case? This has a sort of rhetorical reading of, it can't be the case, so <laughs> what is the case? Um, uh, I'm at least involved in showing that the claim that it can't be is, is too fast. Um, and based on the misconception of, of, of logic, um, then there's the question, how, how metaphysically or something can this be? Um, and that's a question for a model of, of how this might be. There, I want to say two things. One, I think that there are relatively simple models of how you could have a being. I mean, talk of, um, of the extension of a predicate, you know, um, the extension, and, and this contains all the things of which the predicate is true. Uh, and the anti-extension, this contains um, the, the, the set of objects of, of which the predicate is false. And that, you know, we can have weird cases where the intersection is non empty. Um, now, so I think we can have very simple sort of abstract models of how this could be metaphysically. Then you might say, yeah, but I, I want to understand how it's realized, like biologically, physically, all this stuff. There, um, if the worldview is correct, there's going to come a point where that answer is just not available. That's where the ineffability stuff may come in. You can't consistently give it. All you can do is inconsistently say something that, that you know, given our current state, we may not be able to understand. So, good question. Can I up? No. <laughs> <laughs> Afterwards, please. Yeah. Um, okay. So, um, this is just another possible way of understanding this, but I don't know. Um, when I was um, studying medieval philosophy as an undergrad, um, I was told that sometimes uh, some authors believed that God was above logic. And therefore, trying to make logical sense of certain claims is simply a mistake. Okay. To say about. Okay. I am very much not saying that. I reject that. Um, uh, it's an interesting question whether God created logical consequence, that is, specified which consequence relation is logic. But that I don't have anything interesting to say. I find the question interesting. But I think God uh, um, is not above logic in any interesting sense that comes into play in the view I'm advancing. I think. True theology is bound by logic, and true theology is the truth about God. Um, so it can't be sort of against logic in any interesting sense. Thanks. Can I do a follow-up, a quick follow-up, please? Uh, I, I just have a question. I get the sense that canonic uh, research programs would not very much agree that what you have here is a logical conjunction. When you define what a contradiction could be understood by, you said like over there the, the logical conjunction of these two things, or the some kind of thing related to principle of explosion, something like that. But I believe that when they say something like subtraction and addition of the virtues of Christ, they might not be talking about logical conjunction. And maybe when they talk about conditional nature of Christ, they might not be reading that as the logical negation that we know. So how can you do something like that? But I think it was related to the question. Yep, yep, yep. I understand. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> no, it's related how we read uh, religion to logic, for instance. I, I agree. And, and as I said somewhere in the paper, that, that's a tricky question how to sort of, what account of logic they're giving and what they aren't. Here's the way I'm approaching it. I look at what came out in the, um, the sort of approved uh, councils, the statements that were given. Those statements were fueled by all this talk about subtraction, addition, and all that. 
And the result though, not only those, but they, they, that sort of uh, thinking came into play. What was this explicitly recorded was not stuff about the subtraction, this and that here. It was just this, that Christ is um, immutable, Christ and Christ is mutable, all, all in one. The and there, we have no reason to think, except if we are running from a, the contradiction, we have no reason to think isn't simply a uh, simple logical conjunction. So, thank you, though. Yeah. And there's more to say, but, you know. Thanks. Okay, I'll try to make this quick. Um, I, have a, I think it's an objection, but it might just be a concern. Um, but it seems like the rules of the game for a successful Christology are that you avoid heresy. Right. In order to avoid the Nestorian heresy, you need to make sure that you cannot demonstrate in the system that Christ is not equal to Christ, in a sense. That Christ as divine is not the same or is distinct from Christ as human. And I can imagine somebody saying, well, look, the distinctness of these natures is such that it's true that if X is divine and Y is human, then it follows that X is distinct from Y. Right? As sort of an axiom or something. And in E, F, D, E, you can avoid that because the conditional is not detachable. You can say, well, look, Christ is both divine and not, he's both human and not, but he still can remain dis uh, just distinct from, or he, you can't prove that he's not equal to himself. But on the other hand, if you try to embed this Christology into a larger inconsistent theology, you can imagine a lot of people saying, well, I really want a detachable conditional, that's part of my theology. Because if, if X is your neighbor's wife, then it has to follow that you cannot cover a covet X. So when you don't have a detachable conditional, I can see how you can avoid making true that Christ is distinct from Christ. But if you do require a detachable conditional, I'm not sure how you're supposed to escape that. Okay, I'll take that as a friendly comment so that we remain uh, friends. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, no, I, uh, Absolutely right. In a full uh, theory, we want uh, a detachable conditional. A couple things. Um, uh, it might be a detachable material conditional built out of logic, right? A uh, couple things. Uh, one, um, in these theological conditional axioms, coveting your wife and this and that, um, actually, those. <laughs> Yeah, let's not talk about that stuff from the Ten Commandments. I don't know if that's, but anyway. Um, is that in the Ten Commandments? Anyway, all right, um, the conditionals. It may be, and here's the good shit stuff, uh, sorry for those of you who know that, uh, it may be that the conditionals underwriting those theological conditional axioms is not detachable. Um, um, that's one thing to say. There's, there's room then to have detachment but not. Uh, um, the other thing to say, your examples are very important. A lot of identity statements and non-identity statements are central to Christology, to Orthodox Christology, and central to wh where it becomes heresy. Um, but again, uh, I think that some of the hard work in, in any area of theorizing is coming up with the right identity relation for the subject matter. Um, I don't, um, and, and so, um, so I think that there's going to be a lot of room in your kind of identity to accommodate some of your concerns. I don't have the details. I take what you're saying as a very important um, part of the, the project, so thanks. Um, you were very careful in when you were presenting the, 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 cap, the contradictions that are true to say that it is because of the object, so that the properties are the very same property, you're not changing anything about the properties, right? So the properties that are involved in these contra uh, true contradictions are the same properties involved in the at least homophone uh, contingent truths, right? And you were very, very careful about that. So I guess that is because there's something behind that, right? Not just because, well, not, I know, my, my question is whether there is something substantial there that you don't want to say that, well, the way Christ has uh, can suffer is a way of canning suffer that allows for, it's contradictory, but for me, the, my, the way I hold can offer 
uh, the property has a different, but no, it seems that you want to say the other way, the, the other thing, which is also kind of weird because you have to say that the way I instantiate can suffer doesn't allow for the contradiction, but the way God does it because of his nature, just, yeah. But which, which is in the end, a little bit of the, the, the Mm, okay, I, I might not get the question. Um, I found it, I found it, but now I'm not sure. Um, it sounded as if you were saying, um, sorry, this might be hard for you to see from over there. No, no, okay, I just, yeah, so it sounded like you were saying, uh, I was clear that uh, uh, let that be a unary predicate, that's just yeah. a, uh, yeah. uh, I was, I was, I wanted to say the contradictions are like this, right? This might be a complicated thing, but that's the form of a contradiction, where f is the same in both. That is indeed what I'm saying. The moment you change to a different predicate, it's not clearly contradictory. Um, but you also, but you, you also said things like, "Oh, it is because of the kind of a." I mean, why we have, why is this contradiction a true contradiction? Another contradiction, oh! not true. You keep saying, oh, it's because of A. Ah, I've never, I don't know if it's because in the, of this particular example, or there are going to be other cases where it's going to be something about the F. Right, the right, a. right, right. Okay, I don't, I don't know uh, whether this will be satisfying, but I believe this is the true answer, okay? <laughs> um, uh, big picture answer. Logic allows for these possibilities where you have A and not A. That logic allows for it, of course, doesn't mean it's true. How do we come to accept that it's true, A and not A, for some given A? Complicated question. Yeah, but that's but that's not that is not the question because it was not about F A, but what about what is the contribution of the contribution of A and what is the contribution of F in making F A something that holds also not A? If you have some is, true contradictions that depend on the predicate and not on the subject, that could be true about any other A, for instance. <coughs> or if you, most of the contradictions are all of the ones that you have in mind only depend on the subject. That so I would, okay, so I think of just a very simplified, not metaphysically illuminating, but simplified model uh, here. Um, I think of these contradictions um, uh, as modeled in, in this way, that, that you, you've got the one subject and it's, yeah. it's in the intersection of, of what the two predicates, this might be built out of not F or something and so on. But, so it's always the one subject uh, is the way I'm thinking of it. Um, uh, okay, well now I want to think about whether there are other options. Not not right this minute, but um, I never thought about this. Okay, okay. Uh, there are a lot of uh, consistent logic, you know. So some of them reject uh, modus ponens, but there are a lot of consistent logic that accept modus ponens. So maybe one option for reply to Thomas is, well, we only need reject explosion. Uh, what is common in all uh, <coughs> yeah. and logic. Yeah. I also think I also think the dual, but uh, yeah, maybe, yeah. yeah, maybe, yeah. But yeah, but the, the, the point is uh, reject contraction is completely independent to accept or reject most points. Maybe you have another reasons in order to reject most parts, especially in the true topics, paradoxic semantics, you have the Curry paradox that have to reject most parts. You don't have another option, but maybe here you, you would accept a uh, consistent logic that accepts most parts. True. Yeah, but, 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 but this is a, a relatively lateral comment. The, my, my question or, or comment is about uh, the relationship between dialectism and paraconsistent logic. Because uh, here we, we need to reject uh, explosion, but uh, you are saying that we also need to accept that the contradiction is true. But both topics are, and, and this for me, independent. Sure. And 
Second comment is even if you or, or me believe that there, there is a connection between paraconsistency and dialectism, uh, the other problem is to accept uh, a strong point of view about, about truth. Maybe truth is only a deflection, and you, you know that. So we, uh, we don't have the necessity to have a commitment, the ontological stuff. And I believe that in this topic, you need something like that. OK, um, so thank you a lot there. Uh, yes, uh, for all I've said, it's compatible with um, uh, an alternative uh, um, paraconsistent logic. Um, um, I do think that the true theology will also involve gaps, not just gluts. So that's why it's uh, there's a bit more involved. But um, but sure, um, and I'm certainly uh, I think that that a simple FDE account of logic uh, is, for all I can see, very natural, very very natural in a lot of ways, and. Um, but I'm open to there being arguments to suggest that there's a problem. I think there's arguments. Well, okay, that's the first thing. Second, um, um, relationship between uh, a pair consistent logic and glut theory, or a pair complete logic and gap theory. You could be interested. In fact, you could think that logic is either pair consistent, not pair complete, or pair complete, or both, you could think it's FTE, and be neither a glut theorist nor a gap theorist. Mm -hmm. Right. That's why I said, just because logic allows it, doesn't mean it's true. So why be a glut theorist? Well, um, I mean, why believe, why be a theorist in the way that you're a theorist about other things? I mean, it's a complicated process that you try, you know, you pursue the truth and you're subject to all sorts of methodological constraints. One reason that I think in the presence of, or in the lack of excluded middle, that we wind up with glut theory a lot of times is that we have this completely, it's not logical, uh, but this sort of methodological push for completeness. So we want our theories to be complete. We want to, what we're doing as systematic theoreticians is we're trying to decide for each sentence in the language whether it's true or false. We have this methodological push to decide each one. This isn't logic pushing us. It's a methodological principle for a complete account. This rubs up against a sort of the other methodological push for consistency, right? We want, we don't want theories where you have both A and, and not A. But then you can find certain phenomena where it seems like the natural thing to say about them. It's not decided by looking out and counting trees or, or shooting a laser at a, some subatomic whatever. It's, you, you know, you're sort of left with theoretical virtues and it looks like the methodological push for completeness rules for gluts and so on. In this case, you have this tradition where the epistemic basis is, you know, you have these holy books and um, they're supposed to be accounts of this real stuff going on. <clears throat> and uh, then the, the one traditional interpretation of them is this, and you wind up, I say, with, with gluts. Okay, but yes, Paraxicity, paracompleteness, completely independent of whether you're going to be a glut theorist, a gap theorist, okay. Final thing, do you need robust truth or something in this? Um, I think you need more than transparent truth in most of the interesting theorizing. This isn't really truth, it's some truth-like notion that does a lot of carving and distinction making. Um, so I'm sure you'll be right here. But the reason you gave for it, I don't think is right. Um, I mean, I think that this says something about the world. Eduardo is sitting, right? Um, I don't have to be a correspondence theorist to think that this says something. 
about the world. It says something about that object and something about that object's position in the world. I can be just think the truth is transparent, but I'm still making a claim about the world and its ontology and all that. So I, I don't think that the reason you gave for stronger notions of truth is a good one, but I think you're right that we will have stronger notions. Thank you. Yeah. So um, it's a follow-up on the metaphysical worries here. So given what you just said that um, logic is compatible, so it doesn't push itself, so logic's not going to rule out your uh, inconsistent Christology. It seems like the whole debate is on the metaphysics. Um, so we can forget about logic and say that you're right and that logic's not going to tell us which Christology to pick. So the whole thing is on metaphysics, and it seems like we do have a lot more than um, many other tools to decide what to do there. And I'm wondering, um, I, I'm not sure if you thought on the metaphysics side, because you've been working on logic, but it seems like there are alternative accounts of, of Christology that, um, to my mind, seem better than yours. So uh, one way would be to, to think that Christ is just, I mean, accept the doctrine and conclude that Christ is a Manangian object that has and does not have all the properties that the doctrine says, and that's fine. It's just a subsistent, non-existent, non-peculiar Manangian object, and that's fine. That's your theory. Another way to go would be kind of Lewisian and say that your whole uh, Christology discourse is uh, fictional and it is true as truth and fiction is so there is a world that is not our world where there is truly this God that truly has those properties um, one uh, good thing of those I, so I, I definitely find the this one better but it has some advantages which is that we don't have serious problems uh, talking about humans here and saying that there are humans that are that truly are divine and human right so um, it seems like it is a central feature of humanity to be the product of sexual reproduction. Christ was not a product of sexual reproduction, so it's weird uh, for our biology of humanity to accept those exceptions. So on the Louisian account of Christology, we don't have those problems. So why is your theory better? Good. Um, so I take your question well, very clearly stated, um, and two um, attractive options for, for metaphysics related to the first question, um, but giving some, some real detail. Uh, um, <laughs> those are two accounts that could be given um, by someone who rejects that there's a true Christology. Um, and this would be a way of making metaphysical sense of the Christological theory. It's a story. Um, incidentally, according to the story, there is a bit of a, a, a biological reproduction. It's just really bizarre. Um, uh, um, but, but anyway, anyway. Uh, but your point, your, your point, right, is, uh, is, is absolutely right. If you wanted to give a metaphysical account of how this is sort of possibly true, you've pointed to two very natural ones. Um, or if you're trying to give an account of certain um, discourses of things that you take to be untrue, you've given a way of doing that, especially the fictional types of mm -hmm. stuff. But of course, the project is to say, um, if there is a true Christology, what is, what is it? Not how do we explain away the truth, if, the truth of it, but how, what if it is true? So. <coughs> okay, so maybe we should stop now and please. Okay, thank you.